His life was shrouded in secrecy, and he left a remarkable legacy. He received decorations from the Spanish dictator Franco and Queen Elizabeth of Britain. He shook hands with a Hitler aide and swiftly rose to the top of the British intelligence service. But the whole time he was, in fact, a Soviet agent. Many sought to unravel the Kim Philby enigma during his life, and a quarter of a century after his death, it's still the subject of continuing debate. The Cambridge graduate realizes what's in store for him when he agrees to a go to Regent's Park in the center of London for a secret meeting. But he couldn't even imagine how dramatically his life would change after that talk with a stranger. An economic crisis breaks out in the West in the 1930s. Stock exchanges have collapsed, heralding the beginning of the Great Depression. The British Labour Party suffers a defeat. Hunger marches follow on the heels of one another in Britain. Progressive-minded young people begin to sympathise with communist ideals. There was a hunger march that came through Cambridge in, in February 1934. So this was the first time that these privileged students had actually seen working-class people. They felt guilt about being so privileged. They felt horror at seeing the poverty in Britain in the early 1930s. Kim Philby is among the aristocratic Cambridge students helping to provide food for the hungry unemployed. He's reading economics at Trinity College. Philby becomes a member of Cambridge University's Socialist Society, where communist tutors have a good deal of political leverage with their students. So economics was the most radical subject in Cambridge in the 20s and 30s. A lot of Marxist economics was being discussed. Hitler comes to power in Germany in 1933. Europe becomes infected with Nazi ideology. After graduating from college, Philby heads to a restless Austria. For the first time, he sees the horrors of fascism with his own eyes. Philby helps smuggle disgraced communists out of the country. Sonny is shy and at first sight looks non-assertive. He's a typical bookworm. He's ready to do anything for us without any further consideration. By nature, he's prone to pessimism, so he needs cheering up. The Soviet intelligence headquarters received that summary of character of the potential recruit from its agent, Arnold Deutsch, after his first encounter with Kim Philby. The second meeting won't take long. Moscow decides to recruit him. Their timing couldn't have been better, as Philby is about to join the Communist Party of Great Britain. But Soviet intelligence has very different plans for him. Deutsch said, you must now change your, uh, the perception people have of you away from being left-wing and possibly Communist Party recruit to exactly the opposite. You have to build up a fascist front and then you can proceed to your lifelong assignment for Russian intelligence to penetrate the British intelligence service. Philby agrees without further consideration. The Cambridge graduate takes on the role of a fascist, but upholding the cause of communism. He joined the Anglo-German Fellowship. He began to cut himself off from his socialist-minded friends um, and gradually formed a, a new persona for himself. With the help of new contacts, Philby heads for Germany, where he meets with Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop. When Soviet intelligence decides to send Philby to Spain, a country being torn apart by civil war, it was Ribbentrop himself who helped get him the visa. And the Times newspaper accredits Philby as its reporter with Franco's armed forces. The young journalist and intelligence officer reaps the benefits of beginner's luck. On Christmas Eve of 1937, he was riding in a Jeep. Uh, the Jeep was hit with, a, near it, a mortar shell. There were four of them in the Jeep. Three were killed, 
Kim Philby was not. History would have been so different if he had died with the other three that day. Franco personally decorates the young journalist with the Medal for Valor. He doesn't even suspect that the man is only too willing to assassinate him. The original plan was to kill Franco. The job was entrusted to Philby. He was supposed to shoot him or something like that. But the plan was aborted. The reasoning was that another fascist would simply step into Franco's shoes. Philby begins to enjoy more trust from both Soviets and British. However, he isn't recruited by British intelligence until the start of World War II. In 1940, Poland is occupied and France surrenders. Philby joins MI6, where he gives lessons on sabotage and subversion. Philby, uh, once he gets into MI6, positions himself in a way to get as much information as possible. And how does he do it? He gets access to the archives. There is virtually nothing in MI6 archives during the Second World War to which Philby does not have access. Bill Woodfield, who was in charge of the SIS archives, had become quite a friend of mine. He had a liking for pink gins, which I shared. This friendly connection paid off, and I was usually in a position to get files rather more quickly and easily than many of my colleagues. He rapidly rose to be uh, the uh, British intelligence's representative, or in charge of, the whole of uh, the Iberian Peninsula, which was quite an important job because all the peace feelers that came from Germany towards Britain during that difficult period when it was doubtful whether Britain could stand the Nazi attack came through the Iberian Peninsula, came through Spain. During World War II, Bletchley Park is a top secret location in Britain. The most valuable information comes from this encoding center. British forces can decode intercepted German radio messages faster than anyone else. But they're not prepared to share much information with their Soviet allies. Britain possesses several German-made Enigma cryptographic machines. They can only decode messages if they recognize the key. The problem is that the Germans change that every day in a bid to prevent others from listening to their secrets. When you set up the, the machine to a key, there are a huge number of possible ones that you could, you could use, a huge number. Um, the figure that is often quoted is about 158 million, million, million different keys. British mathematicians solved the problem by inventing a machine called BOM for the express purpose of identifying the keys. It works around the clock processing millions of combinations in search of the only correct one. All this is doing is speeding the whole process up and it will, do, it will break that code within approximately 15 to 20 minutes, where it would take you several days doing it with pencil and paper. Bicycle couriers take information to London as soon as it's processed. In fact, Stalin quite often receives as many reports decoded at Bletchley as Churchill. Sometimes, he's even the first to get them. To Comrade Stalin, the Führer has come to the conclusion that the rapid campaign against the Soviet Union is necessary on the grounds that Ukraine should be in German hands before harvest. Possession of southern Russia is essential, since it allows for an alternate base for advance towards Iraq. Over the course of World War II, Philby sends 914 documents to Moscow. Even though his reports are so valuable that they're immediately sent on to Stalin's desk, there are times when Moscow is distrustful of its British agents, notably Kim Philby. They believe that he must be swindling them because nobody could get hold of material as good as this. And they even send somebody to, to Britain to follow him around <laughs> to try and see him making contact uh, with the, uh, the British uh, deceivers who were deceiving the Soviet Union. A turning point in relations with the British agents follows a defining moment in the course of the war. Philby is the first to alert Stalin to Operation Citadel, a planned German advance against Kursk. The largest tank battle of World War II would involve 1,200 tanks in a head-on clash. Having been given advanced warning, Soviet troops mount an offensive, 
leaving enemy forces no chance of success. The Germans pull back after losing about half a million lives in the battle. The Soviet troops then forge ahead, no longer on the retreat. Above everything else, he reveled in the outcome of the Kursk bulge. I did it, he would say. He was proud of the fact that he had supplied very detailed military, technical and strategic secrets that helped win that decisive battle. Of no less importance is the fact that Philby supplies dispatches about the situation in the Allied camp, as well as about the enemy. It's thought that the current Union of Allies would not last. Long before the end of the war with Germany, the Secret Intelligence Service began to turn their thoughts towards the next enemy. Between the wars, the greater part of the service's resources had been devoted to the penetration of the Soviet Union. When the defeat of the Axis was in sight, SIS thinking reverted to its old channels. MI6 sets up a special division for Soviet studies. Moscow gives the talented British intelligence officer the task of penetrating it. Kim Philby exceeds all expectations. In less than six months, the Soviet agent becomes head of the division charged with countering the Soviet threat. In other words, he's the person who is in a position uh, to look at everything that we know about um, what the Soviet Union and Soviet intelligence is doing in Britain, and not simply in Britain, and the contacts that it has with people in the Communist Party. So that was an extraordinary achievement. By a twist of fate, Philby's boss recommends him for an award for his services to Britain during World War II. The Queen personally decorates him with the most excellent order of the British Empire. The career of the intelligence officer continues to rise. He becomes one of the candidates for the post of head of MI6, the highest rank in British intelligence. Philby is sent to Washington in 1949 to promote contact between UK and US secret services. As a result, the Soviet agent finds himself at the heart of every British and American intelligence operation during one of the most tense periods of the Cold War. He is well aware of all undercover operations against countries of the socialist bloc. In particular, he learns about subversive plans in Albania, Bulgaria, and the Soviet Union itself. Groups of saboteurs were regularly airdropped into those countries. British and Americans exchanged precise information about the timing and geographical coordinates of their operations. I do not know what happened to those groups, but I can make an informed guess. The biggest breakthrough, by far, of American intelligence during the period when Philby is in Washington is to break wartime Soviet codes. Kim Philby looks on as the Americans pinpoint the source leaking intelligence about the development of a uranium bomb to the Soviet Union. In 1943, the United States is readying itself to become the world's first superpower with the help of the nuclear bomb. But it soon turns out that the Soviet Union had created an exact replica. When the Americans eventually decrypt Soviet radiograms, they learn that the nuclear leak had originated at the British Embassy. The circle begins to narrow. Philby finds the Soviet agent Donald McLean on a list of suspects. He felt obliged to tell McLean, partly to protect himself, because he didn't know how much McLean knew about his role. So he, he tipped off McLean. Philby seeks help from a friend and fellow Soviet agent, Guy Burgess. Like Philby, Burgess is working in Washington at the same time. Moreover, he's even living in Philby's home. Burgess's task is to meet McLean in London to help him flee to the Soviet Union before he can be interrogated. One of the things that Kim Philby had said to Burgess, go back and alert him, but do not defect yourself because it'll bring out attention to me here in the United States. What horrifies Philby is that Burgess goes as well. And uh, Burgess had promised him that he wouldn't go. Uh, as well. And from that moment onwards, Philby is under the suspicion. Shortly afterwards, Philby is recalled to London to face a series of protracted interrogations. The British stage an on-and-off mock trial over the course of five years. 
but they fail to uncover enough incriminating evidence to prosecute Philby. As an insider and a seasoned intelligence officer, he knows all too well how the system works. A prosecutor cannot uh, give away the reason that he is uh, suspicious of you without also giving away uh, how the, he came to receive that information. As he said, they would say, well, how do you explain this? And he would say, I can't. I mean, it must just be coincidence. Or And he stonewalled and blocked. And the investigator said afterwards, the interrogator said afterwards, I couldn't pin him down. Philby suffered from vertigo. He often said that if British counterintelligence attempted to torture him with heights during interrogation in the early 1950s, he would completely spill the beans. Even though the investigation into Philby is closed, he's fired from his job at the intelligence service. In 1955, Washington insists that the case be reopened. The media is in uproar. They depict Philby as a victim of persecution. The British Foreign Secretary is compelled to make a public statement clearing him of all suspicions. Philby also has to make a public appearance. Well, if there was a third man, were you in fact the third man? No, I was not. After several years of inactivity, Philby rejoins the British Intelligence Service. Former fellow officers don't question his innocence. They find a job for him in Beirut, where he officially works as a reporter for The Observer and The Economist. We were covering uh, the whole area of Syria, Jordan, Egypt, and so we, most of the time we were travelling from Beirut was our base, but we were covering sort of coup d'etats and wars. Richard Beeston is one of those who maintains close contact with Philby in Beirut. The two men often drink and picnic together. No doubt local Britons have already heard a lot about the reputation of the man who had helped Soviet agents to defect. But nobody musters enough courage to ask the question point blank. However, the curiosity of Beeston's wife eventually gets the better of her. We'd been out drinking a lot, and she turned to him and said, uh, are you really the third man? And uh, he said, my dear, what would you do if, if you happened to a great friend of yours who's going to get into trouble? Where are your loyalties to your country or, or to your friendship, you know? And so he really gave it away. It's not until 1962 that MI6 gets hold of credible information from a defector. Kim Philby is finally revealed as a Soviet agent. Nicholas Elliott, his fellow officer, travels to Beirut to interrogate him. And Philby makes a partial confession. What he admitted was being a Russian agent up to 1946, you know, our great wartime ally and so on, but not after 1946. And Elliot and MI6 believe that. Uh, they actually, the head of MI5 and the head of MI6 jointly write a letter to the head of the FBI, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, saying, we believe that Philby has told the truth. He only worked for the Russians until 1946. Uh, the few days later, when Philby leaves Russia, they realize that they're wrong. It's all really rather embarrassing. Philby's escape to the country he spent 30 years spying for is now inevitable. In January 1963, he sets foot on Soviet soil. So Philby spends his 51st winter in Moscow. He's surrounded with care and attention and secrecy. In the USSR, the Englishman becomes comrade Andrei Fyodorovich Martins. The interest in Kim Philby has never waned. Uh, there was very significant efforts to try to monitor what he was doing in Soviet Union. He was needing a comfortable life. Uh, he had a nice flat in the center of Moscow, being the apartment of uh, foreign service officers. He had KGB people to carry out his every whim. If he wanted to go to the Bolshoi, tickets would arrive. If he wanted to book a table at a restaurant, it was done for him. Philby enjoys the perks, but he's aching to get back into action. He seeks work befitting a general, but instead, all he gets is a general's pension. Philby is seen as a hero and is even awarded the Order of Lenin, the country's highest decoration. Yet he's not let out of his golden cage. 
He would tell me that he had been overflowing with information. He would write numerous memos, but later he realized nobody needed all that. You can imagine how that grand, knowledgeable man must have felt. It's no wonder he was prone to drinking bouts. Once he remarked that hard drinking was the easiest way of suicide. I suspect that initially he might even have been doing it with that aim in view. Rufina tries to help Kim overcome his destructive habit. Kim calls her the woman of his life and boasts about her in letters to friends. Radio journalist Eric de Morny is one of them. Am I boasting or abasing myself when I say that her mother is 10 days younger than I am? Anyway, I can attest that the evening of my life is golden. Rafina was put off by the fact that she was 20 years Kim's junior, but she succumbs to his English charm. Kim proposes to her after just a couple of dates. <laughs> He told me right away he wanted to take me to Siberia. I thought it was a funny proposal. Anyone would laugh at the prospect of spending one's honeymoon in Siberia. It's like going to exile. They travel a lot together, both across the vast Soviet Union and in several socialist countries. Bulgaria is their favorite because of the cuisine there. Kim is a talented cook, but he's unable to show off his skills to the full, given the widespread shortages in the Soviet Union. Once we tried to buy a goose, we were told each of us was entitled only to one half of a goose. That was the rule in those days. I still remember the miserable expression on Kim's face. But I can't cook half a goose, he exclaimed. So I had to plead with the shop's top manager to sell us an entire goose, and he complied. That was our joint victory. While living in the Soviet Union, Philby misses some of the home comforts of England. The KGB sets aside a special fund to pay for them. Before each trip to Denmark, I would see the head of the intelligence department to get his permission to buy a thousand dollars worth of goods for Philby. Oxford fruit paste, good tweed jackets and of course whiskey were some of his favorite things. In the 1970s, Mikhail is behind the KGB's decision to open a school to train young men to be secret service operatives. Classes are held at a secret location in downtown Moscow. At long last, Kim Philby has been given the opportunity to lecture a grateful audience on the operations of the British intelligence service and teaches them how to analyze political events. I love the brain teasers he gave us. I remember Philby posing as someone representing the Vatican. We were supposed to spot a tiny piece of very important information in what he was saying. As it turned out, it was contained in the Pope's recent circular letter. Some of the political accents there could change public opinion in all of Latin America, something that would be a complete folly to ignore. He really was a great analyst and scholar. Philip Knightley is the only Western journalist to be allowed to see Kim Philby. The opportunity comes only in 1988, when Paris Stryker is the order of the day. Knightley spent nearly a week with Philby, allowing him to make up his mind about the former agent. It was an ideological commitment, and anybody who says it was not an ideological commitment don't, didn't understand Philby. All these stories about living in poverty and longing to go back to England are complete rubbish. I wanted to, to, to be buried in the Soviet Union because it's a country which I considered to be my own country ever since 1930, 1930, you can say. He was disappointed with Brezhnev, but he thought with Andropov things were going well and that the future for socialism was bright. Uh, he didn't live to see the collapse of the Soviet Union, so he died a happy man. He once told me he wanted to become an orchestral conductor. Classical music inspired him. He always won his arms while listening to it. 
We often listened to Frank Sinatra's My Way together. Kim's life, his character and his aspirations were in harmony with that song. How can I be unhappy here? I've got a wonderful wife. I've got wonderful colleagues, not only in Moscow, but all over the Soviet Union, wherever I go. He's a traitor. He's an extremely able traitor. Regardless of all the names they call him, I think the English are proud of Philby. To them, only an Englishman could be a man of such stature and such integrity. In the long run, when you weigh his uh, contribution to the intelligence wars, uh, he was a major player. People don't forget who Kim Philby is. Here we are talking about him, and he died in 1988, and they still talk about him. In one sense, he had his own immortality. 